Hey, welcome back. In this video, I just want to talk about the two different types of forces that we're going to be dealing with in work and energy problems. So if you remember in the last video, I said that work is equal to the product of displacement and the component of force that is in line with displacement. So that is for the force, we have uh, F. And for the component of it that's in line with the displacement, we have cos theta and then times S, the displacement. So in general, um, the two different types of forces that we have are called conservative or non-conservative. So conservative forces are independent from the path traveled, and they only depend on the force's initial and final positions relative to a reference point. Uh, and that is going to be weight due to gravity and, um, and spring or elastic forces. And for non-conservative forces, they just depend on the path traveled. And so in our case, we're going to be dealing with friction. So let's talk about each of these ones. Let's talk about weight first. If you imagine that we have a surface on the ground like this, and we have a point mass that's falling down, so it has its force of weight directed downwards. Um, if we just pick a reference datum which is basically a line in 2D uh, from its initial point, and then we specify its final point. And all we're going to be interested in in problems with weight, this should be familiar to you, is the, the difference in height. So that's going to be that Y, or sometimes people refer to it as H or S, a few different ways to refer to it. Let's just call it Y for now. But imagine if the point mass was like uh, not falling straight down and was a projectile that had been launched out following a parabolic curve. Again, as far as the work of the weight on the mass is going to be concerned, the, the force, in this case the force of weight, is directed down. It is pointing down and the displacement, we're only worried about the vertical displacement that's in line with that. Uh, so again, even if the, the projectile or the mass is doing something that's not following a perfectly vertical path, we're only interested in the vertical displacement. So springs are similar in a way that it's only their initial and final position relative to a point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a spring here. It's not going to be the best spring you've ever seen. <laughs> Let's call that our spring. So say that the spring is actually connected to a pin here at this red dot, and so it is free to, to spin, you know, to rotate either way around that pin. Then if we rotated it, let's say this way, and, and stretched it out at the same time, so let's see if I can draw this. It's going to get longer. Right, so it's the same spring, but it's been rotated up to this position. Well, the spring force is always in line with the spring axis, right? It's trying to, if we stretch it out like this, it's just trying to pull back against, you know, back to its unstretched position. Or if we were to just press it in, it would be trying to push back to the uncompressed position. But basically, we were only looking for the length that has been stretched out. We're going to call that X in this case for spring displacement. And that's it. That's the only relevant displacement that we need for this problem because that's the displacement that's in line with the force caused by the spring. It's not this blue line here, um, this, this, this path traveled or this straight line distance from here to here that has absolutely nothing to do with it because we could just stretch out the spring here too. And if that X is the same, it doesn't matter if we've rotated it this way or if we've rotated it that way. It's just based on you know the, the deflection away from that initial point that we're pulling against, which is that pin in the middle. And let's come up with one situation for um, friction. So imagine we have a table. We're doing like a top-down view. And again, we've got some kind of pin or something uh, with a cable. And there's a block on the end, right? And so the block is has an initial velocity. And basically, it's just going to spin about that point until the friction, we're gonna say that it has friction opposing the motion, until the friction slows it down to a stop. So in this case, its motion is always tangent to the curve at any given point, no matter where it is, as it goes, as it rotates about 
this point. And that means that the friction is also going to always be exactly opposite. It's going to go like that, and it's going to go like that, and so on. And so we, when we consider how long of a distance the friction has acted, you know, as it's going around, you actually have to take this whole path length into consideration. And that is different from the non-conservative forces because it's not this, you know, we don't just take the initial and the final and just draw a straight line between them and say, okay, it's the difference. That is irrelevant in this case, whereas the actual path traveled is relevant because the component of friction that's in line with the distance traveled at any instantaneous point is always exactly opposite. So we're always considering the full distance traveled. So yeah, I just wanted to make a quick video here just introducing conservative and non-conservative forces and make sure that you know that weight and spring forces are conservative and friction is non-conservative. And the difference is that the non-conservative forces depend on the path traveled and the conservative forces depend on just the initial and final position uh, from an important reference point that you will choose.